to episode 12 of season 2 of the Ubuntu UK podcast. It's Monday the 31st of August 2009 and in this episode we're going to talk about software snobbery, we'll cover the latest news and events, we're going to talk about OGCAMP, followed by our new segment Just a Moment. Then we'll do the competition, ecosphere and feedback. I'm Laura and with me this week are Alan. Hello. Hello. Welcome to my kitchen. I mean the studio. Ubuntu UK podcast studio B. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, very good. Yes. Yes. Hello. Yes, I'm doing well, actually. Yeah. Somebody on Didentica suggested your kitchen should be orange and brown. Well, I've got the red. Yes. We just need the orange and brown, and then we're sorted. No. Yellow. It's yellow, orange isn't it? Orange and yellow. It's red. Oh, God, I don't even know the colours. It's blue, isn't it? No. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Open a jar of curry sauce and throw it around the kitchen a bit. <laughs> so what have you been doing? Well, um, a couple of small projects that I've... I didn't know about until fairly recently. Well, I kind of knew about roughly in the background of my mind, but um, and they're both hosted on Launchpad. One's called WX Banker, and it's a money um, type app that lets you track your spending, that kind of stuff. So you can put in each transaction, and it keeps a record of you know mm-hmm. your budgets. It's like a home budget system, and um, had a little play with that, and filed a few bugs, and got chatting to the developer, and um, yeah, it's quite cool. And another one called Open Mola which is by a guy called Neil Wallace, and um, he's a dentist, and it's a dentist app to run his his surgery. Oh, well, you know, like A36B2. Yeah, yeah, a picture of teeth, and yeah, it shows a picture of teeth in the thing, and so that the hygienist can, like, identify which ones have got problems and stuff, and it does patient records and all that kind of stuff. And that's free software, is it? Yeah, it's written in Python, it's hosted on Launchpad, and, um, and I downloaded that and tried that out as well, and filed a few bugs, and... Yeah, it's, it's really quite cool, actually. Good fun. I did not oh. know you had an interest in amateur dentistry. dentistry. No. Well, <laughs> amateur <laughs> Look. dentistry. He's out in the garage every weekend with a <laughs> pair of pliers and a drill. <laughs> yes, Boy, have you seen my teeth? <laughs> yes. And um, there was something else. Oh, yeah, and a hot tip that I got from um, one of the guys in the Ubuntu UK channel, Ollie. Um, I was asking about something completely unrelated, and he mentioned this thing that's really cool that Tony might like which is the ability to watch videos on YouTube without having Flash installed. Oh, right, okay. It, um, it uses Grease Monkey, and there's a script for Grease Monkey, and it plays around with the page in such a way that it plays the video in whatever your um, browser plugin is for movie playback. Oh, like, and it's like the totem brilliant. Yeah, like, like Totem or Mplayer or whatever thing. So hang on, the actual video is in a Flash file format? No, it's um, in MP4. Or, well, I don't know, it might be FLV or MP4 or something, because some of them are X264 or whatever. Yes, I'll have to look into that. It's really good. I'll put a link in the thing to, to how you do it, but it's really just install Grease Monkey, install the script, and then whenever you go to YouTube, you get the video, and it doesn't play to start. You just click on the video, and it opens a totem thing, and it's actually bigger than the normal YouTube thing. It's brilliant. Oh, the, the thing that pains me is our listeners are missing out on the hand gesturization that's going on here. <laughs> There's and a lot the, of podding. Uh, and the terminology as well. <laughs> yes, we right. love gesturization. That has been talked about before. <laughs> <laughs> so go on, David. What have you been up to? Well, it's actually been quite a heavy week, to be honest. Um, I mean, as everyone knows, every six months or so, a new version of Ubuntu comes out. Well, in order to try and get that stable, there's a thing called feature freeze. And what that means is a freeze um, on new packages coming into Ubuntu and uh is actually set in place. And then the rest of the development cycle is basically making pretty much what's there into a stable situation so it can be released. Well, that kicked in on Thursday, um, or was Friday morning, midnight anyway. Uh, So late Thursday night. Was Thursday? You were up quite late that night, whatever night it was. Yeah, well, it was was rather late. Now, um, so there was actually quite a lot, lot, quite a lot I wanted to get done. One of the things I was doing was redoing the Myth TV theme packages um, cause it, currently each package was a separate, um, it was a separate, had a separate source package, separate entity. Um, so the idea was to, was to basically see what's in upstream in, in the actual myth TV, um, SVN and actually pull that in and build a package automatically based on what's there. So new package for each theme. And that was, that was quite tricky. Um, so there was that, uh, the other thing, oh, I mean, traditionally it takes quite a long time to try and get a package synced from Debian into Ubuntu. Um, or you, you can put a request in and then you might get it in a month later or something. Well, there was a package that was, that was missed uh, uh, called FLV Streamer. And I really wanted to get that in Ubuntu. Well, that was only you know, about six o'clock or something, wasn't it? Mm. We were talking about it, weren't we? And uh, so I, I raised a bug about that. Um, I got it approved. 
and synced and uploaded within like a couple of hours. Mm. I was like, wow, that happened fast. But the sad thing is you need to know who to prod in order to get them things approved. Yeah. Um, wow. There's other things I've been doing. Oh, um, oh no, you put me on the spot now. Um, there was something else I've done, but bang, I should have written it in my private wiki. Because we don't do this every episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a complete surprise to Dave no. when he gets asked at the beginning of every single show oh, what he's been doing. Uh, but no, that flat fluv streamer thing, FLV streamer, is quite handy because that's, in, in, that's used in Get iPlayer. Well, yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. It's, a, it's a recommend of that package, but it's actually a fork of another project that Adobe said, no, you're not having that. Oh, the RTMP dump. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's actually a fork of that that removes the stuff that Adobe didn't like. All right, cool. So, yeah. And that's now in, in Ubuntu and it's going to be in Comic. It is, yes. It cool. Is, yes. Oh, um, oh, there was also other stuff uh, that I've just remembered. Uh, trying to do asterisk stuff as well, trying to, trying to get that in as well, uh, trying to get a, a, a sync. I was working with someone else to try and get that in. I can imagine what it was like. Yeah, uh, to be honest, I mean, I think I did more Ubuntu stuff that week than I did proper post Six work months. stuff. <laughs> but, <laughs> but anyway, I'll, 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 I'll go on to Tony. So I go on, Tony. I've not done anything. At all? No, I really haven't been. I've been using my computer, but I've not been doing anything um, with it, really. Okay. Excellent. I've been wiping my computer and handing it How back did you, to did you, ah, you were going to yes. use DBAN, weren't you? Um, I looked at DBAN, which is a whole disk wiping thing. Yeah. In the end, I used Wipe. What's Wipe? It's a program called Wipe. What does it do? It wipes. Um, literally, you just sort of wipe. This is like, like pulling instead of teeth. RM, instead of RM. I should get into my dentistry because <laughs> yeah. this is just like pulling teeth. <laughs> well, it's so, funny, instead of using RM, you use wipe, right? And it does multiple wipes uh, over the, the file. The, and but the clusters, it so you yeah. know it's gone. Okay, right. at, at, at a basic level, um, you're basically trying to securely delete files. But if this is your own computer, why, why are you doing that? It's not my own computer. I've finished my job, so I was handing it back. Oh, okay. So, so why didn't you use the? I mean, for people who don't know, DBAN is you say a disk you put in, turn on, and without any warning, it just like blams the computer, doesn't it? It's purely deleted. No, no. I think it gives, does give you a warning, doesn't it? Yeah, because it lets you choose which disk you want to wipe. It does whole disks. It doesn't do partitions. I thought it did it without any warning last no. time I tried. You can get a version which is switched. Oh, okay. Ah. Oh. So the uh, studio kit's changed since last episode because you've given the laptop back in. Yeah, so we're recording onto a Zoom H4n now. Is that good? We'll tell you when the episode comes. <laughs> <laughs> so far, so good. You, you have pressed record, haven't you, Tony? I think so. The lights are flashing. I, I think that's a good thing. Isn't that one of those oxymoronic questions that if... <laughs> if <laughs> nobody's ever going to know that you asked that question if he didn't <laughs> press record. Yeah, this is true. <laughs> Laura, what, what have you been doing? Uh, I've been downloading and trying out the Sugar on a Stick distribution. Um, on your OLPC? Not on my OLPC. It's just on my ordinary laptop, but on a USB stick that's bootable. Ooh. So it's um, the Sugar operating system that goes on the OLPC. But um, Sebastian Zidalis, I think he's called, uh, who I met at FOSDEM uh, in February, um, he's set up... He's, part of the team that's created this USB stick distribution. Um, All right. And I tried it out this afternoon. Sorry. (laughs) Talking to the microphone. (laughs) (laughs) I'm sorry. I've not not done this in a while. But but sugar on a stick. Who thought of that name? (laughs) It just cracks me up. Sugar on a stick. (laughs) Okay. Okay. (laughs) Poor Dave. Dave. Dave's now gesticulating. Dave's gone pink. (laughs) I'm trying not to laugh. (laughs) Don't hold it in, mate. So, shall we get on with it? And breathe. Sounds like a fun pack show. (laughs) Last week, Dave talked about how uh, he felt about people who perhaps had not used Linux and maybe felt they were, I don't know, not less, um, lesser geeks. But, uh, you know, that kind of message came across. And... Um, I alluded to the Arch Linux people as being people who've defected from Ubuntu and, you know, look down on Ubuntu as it being too mainstream. And then this week I installed Webmin on a machine and I kind of felt a bit dirty doing it. I kind of <laughs> felt like I should do it in quiet, in secret, because people might say things about me. And it kind of made me think about software snobbery and is there is there an element of snobbery that we have about software packages and is it called for, is it completely uncalled for? I think that sometimes there are elements of, software, of, snob, of snobbery about software and sometimes they come from 
legitimate routes or legitimate sort of sources. Things like Webmin, for example, had a reputation for doing things in a sort of quite a hacky way to be able to manage mm -hmm. all these different programs from a web interface, mm -hmm. just like um, RPM had a reputation for dependency hell, which was a long time ago, but hopefully things have improved since that, then. That mud sticks. But the mud sticks and the snobbery doesn't go away. Mm. Um, just like, you know, Skodas and things. You know, the new Skodas are a lot <laughs> better than the old Skodas, but people still say, oh, it's a Skoda. Yeah. And and I think sometimes that people just take a long time to get over it and they've got these preconceptions that they don't let go easily enough. And how, how can we help to get rid of those misconceptions or preconceptions? Because I'm using Webbin and it actually looks quite nice. And They have certainly funked up the web interface in the last couple of releases, haven't mm. they? It, 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 it did really look nice. very basic yeah. then. Yeah, so. yeah, but does it do more than just look nicer? Oh, well, yeah, there there seems to be more functionality in there. Yeah, I, I don't know whether it's any less hacky or any more secure. I don't know. Um, but but have, you, have you ever been snobbish, snobbish about something? Have yeah, totally. Ever... I was last week when I talked about, well, no, I kind of projected the snobbery yeah. onto the Arch Linux guys making out like that. Yeah, totally, I have. But have you been, I mean, snobbery about, I mean, about Gen 2 or something? No, know? it's been, um, actually, it's been more, um, well, I don't know if it's snobbery. It's, it's... I think I mentioned it last time when I've seen people who uh, have only grown up with Windows and have never had to do like hack around with DOS files and stuff. And, and you think, ah, oh, you know, I don't know whether that's just command me line. being, yeah. Yeah. If they've never had to use a command line, there's, there's kind of an element of me of thinking, ah, oh, you whippersnappers. But then I think there are people who are probably just older than me who look at me and think, Oh, you never used a PDP eleven or something, you know, <laughs> and think of me as being, you know, never have a program on punch cards. Exactly. It's like Red Hat got a lot of the geeks into Linux, um, and then all of a sudden Red Hat was so mainstream, as it were, um, and, and it wasn't cool on. anymore. It was yeah. like the Windows of, of well, Linux. like the Ubuntu of Linux. Well, yeah. and now, exactly, and now Ubuntu's gone the same way, and it's so mainstream that people go, oh, "I don't want Ubuntu anymore." But for a while, Ubuntu was the cool thing. Yeah, I, I, I think actually I agree with you there. I think sometimes you find with, with sort of niche um, items, such as some of the subjects we're talking about, uh, where people um, find there's almost not enough for them to do. So they think, well, let's do our own, you know. And in some ways, you've got well, the not, like, not invented here. Or, well, not so much that. It's just, you know, if every crevice is filled, then, you know, you stop people that think, well, actually, I want to do some cool stuff. And you think, you know, are, are there enough rough edges? Well, you know, should we like, like make our own separate so one? So is it just about ways? being niche? Is it just about looking a bit different? When you open I, up your laptop, it looks different from everybody else. I yeah. think there is an element in the uh, Linux world of users who are like that, to be honest. Mm. Yeah, and, I, and that's why I see, and this is my perception, whether it's right or wrong, I don't know, but that's my perception of a lot of people who move on to things like Arch Linux is because they feel, some people for this reason feel that Ubuntu is too mainstream and it's not and it's not tricky enough for them and it's not hardcore. You know, the fact that you can put a CD in and it works, that's, that's not cool enough, that's not hard enough. But you need people like that, otherwise we wouldn't have got where we are now because you need people to take that niche risky approach. And then it develops, and yeah, then it doesn't suit them anymore, so they move on to something else. Yeah, but you need that in developers. Do you need that in users as well? Yeah, to do the testing and getting it into the mainstream in the first place. Once it hits mainstream, they move on. By it, it, definition, it's, it's mainstream. It's also voting with your feet as well, aren't you? I mean, if something becomes very popular, then they're doing something right. Yeah, so therefore you bring that into your own. So actually, having multiple distributions is actually a really good thing because all the good things can be plucked out to make better ones. But is also a very popular distribution, by definition, trying to cope with the broad band of the mainstream. Yeah. Where, it, whereas it doesn't necessarily tailor, perhaps, to specific. I don't know. Well, that's uh, that. I mean, that's why we end up with it, with um, derivative distros Absolutely, of Ubuntu. Yeah, is like yeah. Mythbuntu because the stock Ubuntu didn't have good Myth packages in it, and then you get other um, distros. I think Backtrack is Ubuntu based and open, is a uh, open box and. Um, yeah, and Crunchbank, Crunchbank, Crunch right, and right. all these others who are, which are derivatives of specialised, mm. you know, taken that base of good stuff. I mean, we took a base of good stuff in, in Debian. Yeah, and absolutely. you know, we've now got Ubuntu, and they've taken Ubuntu, and then you know, I'm sure there are people who derive something from, mm. you know, Crunchbank. So something I would like to go back to. You said about using Webmin. Uh, did you actually find that it made it easier to do what you were trying to do? Uh, actually, no, and I've not really logged on to the Webmin yeah. interface other than to go, oh, yeah, that looks nice. There are a couple of things I wanted to tweak. 
Um, and actually, when I Googled around, I found the command line way of doing it yeah. or the, 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 the file to hack to do yeah. it directly. Because, I mean, you're pretty competent on the command line. And, uh, well, yeah, I am. But there's a specific thing that I wanted to do that I'm not very proficient with. Yeah, but when you actually worked out how to do that, it's not that tricky. It's not that much to read. I mean, people no, have no, this no, conception. I, I disagree. It's, it's not that the thing is, is easy or tricky. I wanted an easier interface to do it. Yeah. I, I, it's not that it's not that hard. None of this stuff is that hard, but I just wanted an easier yeah. way to do but, it. But I mean, what I was going to go on to say was um, there's a, a conception that um, using the command line is some way difficult. Yeah. Well, for this particular thing, it, it it's not straightforward. For the thing I wanted to do, which is setting up firewall rules, you know, oh, yeah. Yeah, okay, you might look at me like that, but IP, IP tables is not as simple as typing cow say hello. Yeah. It's, it's a command line tool that is not as straightforward as you No, it's. no, but there are many wrappers around that. I mean, there, there, there's yeah, yeah, and one of them is Webmin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 fair and enough. And one of them is UFW, and, and there are loads of others. And the fact is, if there are wrappers around it, then it isn't that easy. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, like, UFW is a command line tool, and you just type UFW, allow from IP address and port number. Yeah, okay. Let, let's go from where I was going. For my specific circumstance, where I was going from, I had a firewall machine running IP cop, and that's got a web interface. And I was used to having a web interface and being able to go forward this port to that address, you know, for Skype on this machine or for torrents on that machine or whatever. And I could go to the web interface and go click, 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 done. I wanted the same functionality, but I didn't want to use IP cop. I wanted to use Ubuntu on my Viglin. Yay, Viglin. (laughs) And I wanted to have a web interface. And I thought, I know, I'll try Webmin. You can actually, I believe you can actually run IP cop on Ubuntu. I didn't want to run IP cop. I wanted to run Webmin. But is is the point that just because there is a GUI way of doing something the barrier to entry is then therefore lower and therefore more people can get involved and do it so you feel less cool or less elite by well, yeah. doing it that I, way. I clearly, you know, I feel less of a nerd because I felt bad using Webmin. <laughs> I should I should have learned UFW or IP tables or whatever the underlying yeah. foo is, but actually I didn't want to. I, I actually, you know, why should I? Why should I learn how to use FFmpeg when there's a GUI in front of FFmpeg. Why should I learn any other command line tool like curl and wget when there's a graphical tool in front of it? Why should I, yeah, okay, the command line's cool, but why should I be made to feel stupid or no. or, or somehow inadequate for not learning that command line tool when there is a GUI out there? No, no, I'm, I'm, I hope I'm not giving that impression um, that, I, that, I'm, that I'm actually... Uh, <laughs> I didn't no, mean... I was kind of projecting it on myself. I yeah. was thinking oh, right. okay. I, when I okay. when I installed women, yeah. I felt like people would think yeah. I was stupid. No, yeah, no. I mean, the reason is for me is that I mean, someone in the Ubuntu community once wrote, and I can't remember who, but if you have to do something via the command line, it's a bug. It's a bug. Yeah. And to me, I totally disagree with that because the command line isn't scary, and there's a lot of things which are much easier to do on the command line than they are in a in a, in a GUI. Yeah, but that's because you sit using a command line all day. So to you, it's not a big deal. I, I used to use a command line when I had to, and now I hardly ever have to. So for me to switch to a command line and all the faffing around doing man the command and find out what all the parameters are, it's not worth the hassle. And I don't feel like I want to make that effort. I'd much rather well, just find something that's a lot more obvious. Well, why do you say that? Uh, my parents had a, computer, uh, had a problem with networking the, the other day. Yeah, and they're... they're, they're fairly new to any Ubuntu. They're, they're not computer experts, you know, they, they, are, they, they are just users. Um, so they've never used the command line before. And uh, in order to get networking back, I just said press Control, Delete F1, type your username and your password, and type sudo dhe client 3. Yeah, but That's not the same. You're, you're giving them the command to type yeah, in, and anyone can do that. It's when you have to look at the command yourself to learn Anyone can follow it. instructions yeah. verbatim. And I agree, it's easier to give but instructions the thing that is, way. If, but the thing is, if I had to tell them to do something in Network Manager, yeah, I would still be giving them instructions. They wouldn't be looking it up themselves. They, they wouldn't know where to click. Um, yeah, so, but they so could I would be giving them out. instructions. They could figure that out. So I, but I essentially, what, I, what we're saying the thing is, I would, I would. I know for a fact I would still be having to tell them over the phone. So I would be saying, "That's, click, yeah. that's click different." Halfway is, down, you'll see a button that says, "That's this. different." This is a different thing you're trying to address there, though. You're trying to find an easier way to give instructions. What Poppy or I was trying to do is you're trying to work it out yourself, and it's a lot easier if you've got a lot of fields with labels on them than it is if you've got to go man something and find, scroll through hundreds of different options to work out which one's appropriate. Because GUIs that's are the, easier to explore. Yeah. 
Well, they're, they're more restricted. If they're decent. Generally. They're more restricted and they, they, they present a summary of options. Maybe not all of the options yeah. available, but, yeah. you know, some of them. Like, look, for example, the ad, ad user screen. Mm. If, if your parents uh, said, uh, we've got a lodger coming to stay and I want him to be able to use the computer, I want him to be able to log on with his own account and set his own email up, would you tell them to go control alt f one and run sudo ad user Jeff or would you tell them to go system administration users and groups press the ad button press the unlock button press the ad button type in Jeff put in all his details and press OK I would tell them by the command I'd go applications accessories terminal and type sudo ad user and then just follow the commands because I'm not convinced that they would learn anything from that so next time you'd have to give them the same and, and that perpetuates that you have to use, oh yeah, my son Dave has given us a new computer. It's very good, but I have to keep using the command line. Every time I phone him up, I have to use this terminal <laughs> thing. It perpetuates the, the, the fallacy that you have to use the command no, line no, on Linux. No, th- 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 there's different options. So, so, you're, so what you're saying there is that I mustn't give them instructions via the terminal. No, I didn't say because, that. Because otherwise I'm making the situation worse. No, because what you were doing before is giving them a specific network setup thing but for say adding a user if somebody's coming to stay then somebody is going to come to stay another time as well so they're going to want to be able to do it again also the add user gui in uh, ubuntu is far simpler than the ad the uh, network manager gui i mean i'm not convinced yeah. anybody yeah, would okay. work that out yeah but to be honest i don't even know where the ad, i mean i was actually bitten on the on the um, yes, yeah, so I was actually bitten by this uh, a while ago where someone actually, I was actually trying to demonstrate how to install software and I couldn't remember where Synaptic was because I, I never use it. I always use yeah, it. That's, 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 that's another is, issue. That's your familiarity. Is, yes, it is because I was actually going to say, oh, you, you could, there's all this stuff you can install and I couldn't remember where Synaptic was because I never use it. So, no, but I, I'm the same though about command line in that I used to use AppGet all the time on Debian and I actually, never use it now and I actually go to Synaptic. You've first. confirmed the issue there. If you keep on using the command line, you perpetuate the fact that you have to use the command line. No. If, you'd, if you'd use Synaptic and you were familiar with the GUI and your parents were familiar with the GUI and, they, and you'd pass that on to them, then they would naturally be able to navigate to there and find all the admin tools under that menu. No, no, because I'm not unfamiliar with Synaptic because I haven't used it. I'm unfamiliar with it because I've never really used it. That's the same sentence with the word really in it. No, no, no. As in, as in it, was, it wasn't something I used to use, then I started using the terminal and then I forgot where, where it was. It, it's more because I, I don't actually, think that really matters. You're not I think, in the habit of using it. No, yeah, it's because I've never yeah. really used it in anger. Okay, so yeah. as experienced Linux geeks, are we maybe not deliberately snobby about the GUI admin tools, but just because we're not familiar with them, because we've always had to use the command line versions, we don't encourage other people to use them or we're not familiar with them, so we can't give better support as a result. And, it, and is it more about us actually not knowing what to do with those tools? As a Linux geek... I get really irritated when people give me a command line um, instruction to do something that I'd normally do through, say, Synaptic. And I'm perfectly capable of using AppGet, but I'd much rather use Synaptic. Okay, so we did tweet and dent this earlier in the uh, in, in the evening, and I think we've had some responses from various members of the UUPC listening community. Um, Laura, who, who have we heard from? got Lopter, Andrew, Andy oh, Ball, Lopter. Yeah. Uh, says, there is, number, there is snobbery in open source. I know because I've been guilty of it. I was dismissive of Linux for years and had to open my mind. <laughs> ah, the BSD <laughs> community. Presumably he's I was, yes. Yeah. 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 Okay, and another Andy, Andy Smith, uh, Griffers. Um, he says, snobbery, yes, there's people proud of using fringe OSs for the sake of it and believe that they're better than you for it. Um, he says he personally believes control panels and GUIs, this is referring to the web admin side of things, um, control panels and GUIs are the wrong way to administer things, but that's for technical reasons so rather than for snobbery reasons. Okay, so he's talking about the fact that if you edit it in a, in a GUI, it might screw around with the files at the OS level and then... Well, no, that, yeah. that's a poorly written application rather yeah. than... A, but that's a technical problem rather it's than... It's coming a, back yeah. to the perception thing, isn't yeah. it? Mm. And Liam Wilson has emailed in in response to our tweet that he got on the email very quickly there, um, saying that he does think there is some form of snobbery in geeks. As a geek himself, he tries to be as polite as possible whenever he's helping someone, whether it's a member of, a member of the Ubuntu forums or friends and family. As a user of Kubuntu for the last two years, he's had his fair share of problems trying to get hardware and software to play nicely with his setup. But it depends really on, on the place you ask as to the responses that you get. Um, for a place like the Ubuntu forums, there's bound to be a couple of geek snobs he asked for help with Wine once and had a user rant at him because he replaced a couple of Wine DLLs with a native Windows one. 
just that he didn't know it was going to break wine very badly, which apparently it did. <laughs> um, but he says that we should actually be a bit tolerant because people give up their own time trying to help a bunch of users and you know, occasionally people get a bit um, snobby or forget their place. Yeah, yeah. Which I think is a, a fair comment. Thank you, Lim. Apache uh, UK said, uh, in my humble opinion, whatever it takes to get the job, gone, d- job done, if the shortest path is a gooey, so be it. That sounds good, no? Well, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the fact that um, if your parents want something done, like add a package, add a user, whatever it is, the quickest way to get it done would be to, for you to tell them, type this command. If, that, if that's the fastest way to get the job done, then yes. If that's the goal, get the job done, get out, then sure. If the, if the goal is pass on some knowledge so that they can do it next time, then I, I don't necessarily think it's the way forward. Because once you've taught something line. like Synaptic, you know, they'd be able to go into Synaptic and search... And install all t- kinds well, of yeah, rubbish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mess the machine up. What, once you've shown them what a search bar is, to say, I'll search for a particular term, they work out they can put any term in there and come up with a load of related and next time you could just say what the package name is. Yeah, you, yeah, yeah. you could say, use Synaptic to... to install, brr, through, yeah. or But as you say, it depends what the goal is, if it's I, just to get something done. I, I think I should probably add that just because uh, someone is doing something a different way to what I think, I don't think they're inferior for it. Um, <laughs> they're just not educated. <laughs> no, 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 uh, no, I don't mean that at all. Um, <laughs> that is so not getting edited out. <laughs> Okay, well, perhaps listeners can uh, email in with their thoughts about what, what software snobbery is, what it means to them, their experience. And whether they've experienced it, and yeah. yeah. And uh, email it into the standard email address. The Australian Defence Force's new combat flight simulator runs Linux. Yay! Uh, using AMD CPU and NVIDIA GPU-based system in a cluster, the new kit runs on top of SUSE Linux. Excellent. I know nothing about flight simulators other than the one that I used to crash into the ground all the time on my PC. Yeah, they're very complicated, <laughs> rather like Linux. Skype have put out a new release of their popular closed-source proprietary format VoIP client for Linux. The new version promises the usual quality and performance enhancements, with probably the most useful feature being support for Pulse Audio. Hmm. Useful. Well, useful for, for Ubuntu users and Fedora users and any other user of Linux who's using Pulse now, I guess. Hmm. It's always been a bit tricky getting Skype working with. I've Pulse seen one users. really bad example where it says, tick this box to run a script when you receive a call that essentially uh, suspends Pulse Audio and runs normal Elsa. And then when you finish, you press a button that comes up to say, go back to normal sound. That, to me, is pretty damn dirty. Mm. And on the same subject, <laughs> Ruben, ooh, how am I going to pronounce that? Untrega, a Swiss software developer, has released a source code for a program for tapping into encrypted Skype conversations. Ruben's software needs to be installed on a machine making or receiving the Skype call and can intercept the audio from Skype using a DLL injection attack and forward it to a third party. Okay, so it's not an on-the-wire attack? Doesn't seem to be, no. But then it depends what your rationale is if you want to, you know, listen to someone's conversations. If really that badly, you might try, you know, various other methods to hack their machine. Yeah, for example, using Pulse Audio and then just... (laughs) (laughs) And being a DLL injection attack, presumably that's only on Windows as well. Yeah, it seems that way, yeah. Judge Dale Kimball of the U.S. District Court for the District of Utah has overturned a 2007 ruling which previously resulted in Novell holding the Unix and Unixware copyrights. As usual, PJ over at Grocklaw has comprehensive coverage. So does this affect the whole SCO case? Yeah. D- um, Dale, what's his face from uh, SCO, has been going on saying, this is a fantastic day for SCO because it means, you know, we're, our, our case is validated and we can go pursuing all these Linux users who are using so our hang code. On. Is, is SCO actually still going? Well, they're, they're in Chapter 11. Uh, which is one of the stage to bankruptcy, yeah, bankruptcy protection, and they, they, I don't think they've got anyone assigned uh, uh, to look after their finances or something yet. But they're moving towards Chapter Seven, which is bankruptcy. So actually, if this happens fast enough, then hopefully every Linux user will be paying them to keep them alive. Oh, Let's hope not. Good. 
Sharp have announced a new mobile internet device Ring Ubuntu, sporting an 800MHz freescale CPU, a 5-inch 1024x600 screen, half a gig of RAM, 4 gig of solid state storage, 10 hours of battery life and a 3 second boot up. The Sharp PCZ1 will be available in Japan initially. No word yet on worldwide availability. It looks rather cute. Have you seen the pictures? No. It's like a little clown show. It's like um, like a, a, one of the old um, Scion type things. Not oh, quite, yeah. not quite like that. Oh, but cool. you know that kind of small, smaller than a laptop. Well, I must say, three seconds is quite formidable. But the actual specs aren't overwhelming, aren't they? No, no. It's like a like a netbook in a very, very yeah. small device. Yeah, sub netbook. Yes. <laughs> In an announcement to the Myth TV developer mailing list, Daniel Christensen has announced the feature freeze of the popular open source DVR package. If all goes well, we should see Myth TV version 0.22 released very soon. <coughs> Is there any clue as to what's new and funky in 0.22? Well, first of all, I should say 0.22... Um is already actually in Karmic. Uh, we're planning on it being released in time. Uh, mm-hmm. Otherwise, um, we've got trunk code still actually as packages. But um, yeah, it is, uh, the UI is very much funked up. That, that's probably the main thing people will notice. Are you going to be able to fix that before the release? Fix what? Funked up. Oh, right. Okay. Sorry. Funked up. Right. Looks better, uh, I think okay. is what he meant. Right. Nokia officially announces the N900 the natural successor to the N800 and the N810 line of mobile internet device. The N900, running on the MIMO platform, is also a phone. Yeah, a lot of people didn't think it would be one. Well, it's a bit of a change from their tradition. I mean, Nokia coming from a mobile background and releasing devices that That aren't phones. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. But yeah, I had the N810 and it really bugged me it wasn't a phone. Mm. Do you still use it? Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, I do. Just not so often. The 900 does look very nice, though. It does look a, very sexy. A flashy video online yes. that Alan showed us before. It's very mm. shiny. Mm, it is. Want. <laughs> Oracle have got the go-ahead to buy Sun for £4.5 billion, pounds, it says here. Is that yeah, dollars? that's right. Yeah. Pounds, right? Yeah, it is pounds, yeah. He has not much more to say about it, really. No. About speculation about what's going to happen to MySQL and VirtualBox. We don't. We're not sure if it's a yay or a may. Google developers are working hard on getting Chrome working on 64-bit Linux before other 60-bit for other 64-bit <laughs> platforms. Meanwhile, the Chromium developers have already released their 64-bit port that Chrome is based upon. Yeah, yeah. Mm. I thought it was news when I mentioned that you know, oh look at this blog post. They're going to make a 64-bit version of Chrome, and the Chromium guys were like, "Yeah, all right, we did that two days ago. Don't worry." Yeah, about it, I would love to see what changes were actually put in. I mean, you know. Can actually make programming for different platforms normally isn't much of an issue so I'd love to see what they changed it's the, the, one of the things that they were focusing on was the V8 the JavaScript engine oh put in that 64 bit Moonlight the open source implementation of Microsoft Silverlight have announced a beta of version 2.0 excellent anything interesting in that well some of the um, TV websites work better now so things like ITV which mm-hmm. uses um, Silverlight um, now works apparently. Cool. What does Silverlight actually do? Uh, it's like Microsoft's version of Flash. I'm going to get loads of people having a problem. <laughs> Essentially, for that. I mean, I just don't care. <laughs> no, it's their it's their online streamy thing, you know, web streamy weemy. But the but the the apps that are inside Silverlight depend on the .NET framework and on Windows, uh-huh. and thus on Linux we use Mono. Mono. Yeah. <laughs> PC World are reporting that Dell is pondering ARM-based Linux netbooks. And finally, the Free Software Foundation have launched an anti-Windows 7 campaign site called windows7sins.org. Mm. Mm. In the same vein as the Bad Vista. Yeah, um, site. exactly. Yes, very much so. Do you think this is popular in the uh, Linux world? doesn't seem so. Feedback I've heard includes um, much the same kind of feedback about Bad Vista mm. and... I think one of the guys said some. One of the guys on the Linux Action Show said it looks like a bad GeoCities site from about fifteen years <laughs> oh, ago. Oh, wonderful! Yeah. Ubuntu developer week 
31st of August to the 4th of September 2009. Uh, see Daniel Holbach's blog for more information. So yeah. you might just have time to get the last day or so by the yep. time this episode comes out. But that's not a problem because yeah. it's all logged on uh, on the wiki. So you can get uh, a transcript of, uh, of everything that's happened over the last few days. So if you're interested in any aspect of developing Ubuntu, that's a place to go. Yeah, like packaging, debugging, that kind of stuff. Software Freedom Day is this year on the 19th of September, 2009. That's this year. <laughs> Just in case that wasn't clear. And as we mention every episode, that also coincides with... Os Bar Camp, which is uh, in Dublin. And some of us are going to be there. Uh, are, you, are you going to be there, Dave? I, I heard well, rumours of your attendance. Well, I'm actually down as doing a talk, but I haven't confirmed my attendance yet. So oh. <laughs> I'd better do that quite soon. Yeah. It's no yes. great surprise that you haven't sort of sorted out flights or anything yet. I just see hey. you swimming across the Irish Sea. <laughs> Atlanta Linux Fest is also on the 19th of September. That's a popular day at the uh, IBM facility on Northside Parkway. LinuxCon, the new technical conference for all matters Linux, is on from the 21st to the 23rd of September 2009 in Portland, Oregon. The third annual Ontario GNU, which I hate, Linux Fest, sponsored by Google and IBM, will be held on Saturday, October the 24th, 2009 at the Days Hotel and Conference Centre Toronto Airport in East Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Wow, <laughs> the that's world, a mouthful. <laughs> the Milky Way, the universe. <laughs> uh, Ohio Linux Fest is on 25th to the 27th of September at the Great, Greater Columbus Convention Centre in downtown Columbus, Ohio. CMS Made Simple Geek Moot 2009, 26th to 27th of September at the Workstation Sheffield, UK. And as if there wasn't enough going on in September already, there's a Launchpad community meetup on the 28th of September in London. There's a link to the uh, Launchpad page where you can find out more about where it's going to be in the show notes. Ubuntu Global Jam will be on the 2nd to the 4th of October 2009. Lug Radio Live will be on the 24th of October New Hampton Arts Centre in Wolverhampton. Are we all going to that? Yeah. Yep. There's a comedy gig for the benefit of Bletchley Park at the Bloomsbury Theatre in London on Tuesday 3rd of November with Richard Herring, Robert Llewellyn, Rob, uh, Robin Innes and maybe Stephen Fry. FOSDEM is on from the 6th to the 7th of February 2010 um, at the University in Brussels. Now talking of Lug Radio, which is only for a day long this time, uh, there's is actually something on the Sunday as well in Wolverhampton, which we didn't mention in the events. What is that, Tony? That is the now confirmed and officially announced well, hey. Og Camp. So this is the joint event that we are putting on with the Linux Outlaws guys. Um, and it's, as, as Dave says, the day after Lug Radio Live. So Lug Radio Live is on the Saturday. This is going to be on the Sunday. Um, and it's going to be in the Connaught Hotel, Wolverhampton, which is the official Lug Radio Live hotel. So Lug Radio Live people have arranged a really good room rate for that hotel so if you're staying there get up in the morning and just come to old camp go and have some breakfast come straight down to old camp you know roll out your bed roll into our event basically is the plan um <laughs> and name uh, speaking of the event it's named og camp it's got nothing to do with codex or camping um no no <laughs> what <laughs> <laughs> um well there was a vote and that was the name that won. Um, well, uh, I only <laughs> voted because that's... Spot. Yeah, but the thing is, you could see what other people were voting for, couldn't you? So I only voted for what was the popular one, to be honest, because I didn't really mind that much. <laughs> you wasted your You're vote. I did, I did. Well, they, they were all quite bad, to be honest. I mean, perhaps, <laughs> per, perhaps, perhaps in the future we can bring up some of the suggestions we had. But yes, there were a lot of emails that went between us and the Linux Outlaw guys. And... I couldn't think of a good name either, to be honest. Yeah. Well, thanks for the glowing recommendation. Um, <laughs> I guess the og reflects sort of free culture, free society, free yeah. media, and the camp is that we're all together. In a hotel, not a campsite. In a hotel, not a campsite. Excellent. Um, but yes, so it's going to run from 11 o'clock in the morning till 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And because it's a bar camp style event, essentially it's unscheduled, um, which means that we don't know what's going to be going on. And there's a fully licensed bar? I, there is a bar in the hotel, but I've got to establish its opening hours yet, <laughs> which we will do before um, the event. Probably be 11 till 4. Yeah, ho hopefully it will match up. Well, uh, so what, what, when you say uh, unscheduled, what's going to happen? What, what can people expect and what do, you want, what do you want people to do? Well, it's really what you, the listeners, make of it. Um, because anybody can come along to the event and do a talk. 
So if you, as a listener, have got something that you've been doing, which is really cool, and you think other people might be interested to hear about, um, so maybe it's a, a project you've been involved with or a bit of hardware hacking you've done or um, some advocacy stuff you've been doing, um, a program you've been writing, something like that, um, anything you can talk about for 10 minutes, half an hour, um, or maybe a full hour if it's a really in-depth, interesting topic, um, anything related to Linux or open source or free software or hardware or free media or culture or sort of free society type things, basically anything that somebody who's involved in open source might be interested in hearing about, mm -hmm. then um, come along and talk about it. Um, now, how does that protect against people turning up and saying, I want to talk about my piece of chalk? It doesn't. It doesn't. That's so no so, idea. so, so what, what happens? Because people I'm, walk out of the talk and go to do something, see something else. <laughs> oh, right. Oh, okay. Okay, so we've got multiple tracks going. Yes, we're going to have three rooms. Um, there's uh, one big room and two small rooms. And um, basically we'll have a... a a blank schedule on the day and um, people can put up things and write their own talks into the schedule and they may choose to sort of, you know, choose where they, where they put it in convenient times during the day. Mm -hmm. um, so something is really popular. We might, you know, if people keep saying, oh, that's, I'm going to go to that one. It's really popular. We might decide to put that one in a bigger room. Right. But it's really fluid throughout the day and um, the idea is it's not that much organisation. <laughs> Which is really good for us, yes. Yes, exactly. But we have had a couple of people say, oh, I'll come along and do a talk. So, oh, excellent. Uh, friend of the show, Andy Stanford Clark, and is going to come along and talk about his tweeting house. And, Excellent. And his hardware sort of mouse traps that he made and things like that. So that'll be a really good talk. Um, and we do know that both of the podcasts, both the Linux Outlaws and us, are going to do some sort of recording um, uh, during the course of the, of the day. So you can come along and see what a complete mess we make of the recording. <laughs> exactly, yes. <laughs> it could be a train wreck. Um, but yes, so basically we would like to uh, you know, to hear what your suggestions for, for your talks are. You don't have to tell us in advance, but hmm. it would be really interesting to see what things people are thinking of. So if you want to drop us an email and, and, and suggest something you want, want to talk about, that would be, that'd be really good. Um, so to the usual email address for that. Um, we'd also like a, a handful of crew, really. Um, so uh, you can just come along and help out. There's no real benefit for doing so other than the appreciation and... The uh, kudos. The kudos for doing so, maybe... You know, we and we might even names? pronounce your name, yeah, correct. <laughs> we might even yeah. pronounce it correctly. D Dave might buy your drink. Um, and you might buy your own T-shirt. Yes, well, we haven't got T-shirts, don't even go there yet. Um, but yeah, so if you want to help out, just sort of helping supervise the rooms, making sure nobody runs off with the projectors, uh, that sort of thing, it will be, uh, again, appreciated. So drop us an email at the usual address. And where can people find out more? There's a website, uh, ogcamp.org, and uh, you can follow OgCamp on Twitter and Identica. And the Facebook. And there's a Facebook event as well, yes. Yeah. So if you go to the OgCamp website, you'll see a Facebook event. And let us know you're coming. Yeah, just help, again, an idea of... of, of the number of people who are coming. Obviously, not everybody uses Facebook. Not everybody likes it. But it's nice to sort of see the people who are on there who are saying. There's about 34 cool. people so far, which is really good. Excellent. Looking forward to that. Yep. Yay! Now, something new we're bringing to uh, this particular episode, we're calling Just a Moment. Mm. Now, it's not a panel game in which the contestants are challenged to speak, uh, but they are asked to speak for one minute about a chosen subject. Now, okay. this isn't something necessarily they've had too much to do to, with, for themselves, but it's something cool they've come across. Okay? Mm -hmm. okay? Okay. So who wants to go first? I think you should. You. Yeah, you. Oh, okay. This is your fantastic <laughs> idea. Well, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll see how it pans out. Now, we have our sound effect standing by and our one-line bash script. Oh, hang on. <laughs> Can we hear the make sound the effect? Noise. Um, no, 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 no. We'll no. save that goodness. Yeah. You'll recognise it when it goes off. Okay. So are you ready, Dave? <laughs> okay, I'll try. Okay, your minute starts in three, two, one. Okay, now something I've come across this week um, is I've actually bought a HTC Hero phone, which comes preloaded with Android Linux, um, which is, you know, it's essentially very similar to an iPhone, but it's not. <laughs> it's, it's actually free software. Uh, all the source code is actually open. And... Um, well, to be honest, when I actually got the box, it was a very small box, um, and I always thought it was just a charger in there. When I opened that, I must say, it, the, our eyes come together, and it was love at first sight. It really was, and it was I could just turn it straight on, it already had power, and we really did find that special connection. Now, I must say, we are still very much in a honeymoon period at the moment, however, it's, uh, it's really good. Uh, however, <laughs> there, there is one slight problem with it. It doesn't come with a podcast client. What's that all about? But Google are developing a very nice one, and there is a proprietary one available. Uh, there are other things I particularly like about it, and that is... Ah! Unlucky. Well, unlucky, Dave. I'm going to tell your good lady wife about your love affair with your phone, though. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, excellent. That's show, showing us how it's supposed to be done. So who's up next? Yeah, go on then. Okay, Alan. Alan is going to brace himself. Um, oh, blimey. Are you ready? The script is standing by. I haven't got a script. No, no, no. Make the, it up. The, 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 oh, the, the three lines crack. The, the one line bash script that's going to stop me Which is talking. probably going to be next week. Some odd line food. Um, okay, <laughs> are you ready? In which case, I'll give you a countdown. Three, two, one. I recently bought a little uh, computer called an Acer Aspire Revo 3600. It's got a 1.6 gig CPU and an NVIDIA Ion video card. And I've been playing with Boxy on it, which is um, uh, mostly open source. It's got a little bit of closed stuff in it. And it's based on a fork of the Xbox Media Center, or Xbox MC, you might have heard of it. And uh, I've got it installed on this uh, thing on top of Ubuntu Karmic, which is not out yet. So it's a little bit unstable and it's broken a few times. In fact, the other night we were watching Michael McIntyre on the telly in HD and then it crashed. And Wifey <laughs> was not very impressed at all. Um, I'm using a remote control, which is a Sony PlayStation 3 Bluetooth remote control. And it sometimes forgets that it's connected to the computer. And I have to take the batteries out of the PlayStation remote, and put them back in again and then close it and then press the button a few times and it wakes it up and I can carry on using it um it's good for playing bbc iplayer and youtube videos and uh video podcasts audio podcasts oh the buzzer has it mm. it's worth mentioning those cost any cost about 150 quid i think yep. but, you know, i'm not allowed, not allowed to say anymore, to say anymore no. so just, just, just. um okay right on to laura are you ready laura yep okay right i'm going to uh, fire up the uh, the bash script again we're all ready here to go in three two one go Okay, recently I've been looking at Gallery 3, the uh, online photo album project. Um, I've got nothing to do with it, but I use it quite a lot. All we did until we moved to Gallery 2, we used Gallery 1 for quite a long time, and it was fine, it was a bit rough around the edges, but it wasn't bad. And then we upgraded to Gallery 2, and I, we just stopped using the gallery completely because we couldn't work out how to use it. Um, the hardest part was probably dealing with permissions on albums, um, because you basically had to understand Unix permissions to do it, but on the whole, it was just awkward to use. So I was started looking at the Gallery 3 alphas, um, which are look really cool. I mean, they've got the bling and the shiny, and they're all Ajaxy and stuff. Um, but also, they've just gone back to basics and totally rewritten it based on sort of user-centered principles. So they realized that they were trying to do too many things for too many people and they focused on who they were going to target oh <laughs> and i really wanted to hear more about gallery oh I like it. <laughs> I've, is, I've just worked out of course this segment is presumably dave's way of making sure that the show isn't an hour and a half long <laughs> yes yes that, that was it and also i was listening to a rival um thing potentially on the on the journey up here ah right okay with uh, uh, nicholas parsons perhaps um, no comment. <laughs> Fair enough. Right, so that... <laughs> admit that we rip our content off the BBC. It's called the today. It's called Just a Moment. Nobody, <laughs> <laughs> nobody could perhaps have worked that out before. Uh, well, good right, anyway. stop waffling to try and get away yeah, from the fact sorry. that it's your turn, Tony. It, it is my turn. I'm just going to program the script to be a bit longer for me. <laughs> no, no, you don't want longer. <laughs> no, okay, fair enough. Right. Um, alrighty. Three, two, one, and then your finger needs yeah. to press the button. Okay, so, I'm st- my finger is standing by. Three, two, one... Okay, um, the thing I'm going to be talking about is video processing on Linux. Um, we talked a little bit about a new video editor um, uh, in the news earlier in the show, but I have been video editing on, on Linux for a particular project recently, which is hopefully going to see the light of day very soon. And for the most part, I've been using KDN Live um, to do that. Now, KDN Live is, has come along a huge amount. I'm using version 0.74, I think, but there are new releases which have more stability improvements. And it's actually good. It can multi-track video. It can put effects and transitions on there. Not perhaps as many effects as, uh, as I would have liked, but they're there and the ones that are there work. But I can supplement it using things like stills to DV to generate sort of pan and scanned uh, images. I'd love to see that feature incorporated into the main editor. Um, and then I can use things like FFmpeg to Theora and stuff to encode all of this wonderful goodness and use Arda to... Uh, I can export all the different soundtracks and use Arda to mix them and add effects and add music and, and put the uh, audio back into the video and hopefully end up with a very reasonably slick-looking project at the end, although other people will have to judge that. Oh, oh. No. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's, that's Just thought fun. you were going to give away the URL there. But, oh, <laughs> yeah, if I had another know. five seconds, I yeah. would have done oh, that. Oh, dear. Now, oh, well. Uh, I think it is worth noting that 
potentially use our listeners can actually submit um, their own just to me oh. Oh. and oh. via our that voicemails is a fantastic idea and if you waffle past 60 seconds we'll just cut it off anyway we'll and, play the and, noise. And, then, and we'll play the noise yeah. and then we'll ridicule you as well. <laughs> actually Dave if you, if you could set up yes. a scripted one that only lets it Record well, yeah. for 60 seconds and then replace uh, the... Uh, a, a special SIP address or whatever. That, that, only, would, be that cool. would be cool. Up until Dave fixes that up, we'll yeah, just use the normal say, address. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, I think I can probably put in a potential menu, press one to normal voicemail, press two for just a minute. Oh, that's, 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 <laughs> just, that's a moment. Just, just a moment. <laughs> <laughs> that's Dave's homework for the next time. But for now, I think it's time for... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> It's time to delve into the ecosphere. Ooh. Are we calling it ecosphere this week? Yep. Hang on, hang on. It, it, Tony, we need to stop letting Alan introduce this. <laughs> yeah, he gets his own <laughs> way too many times. <laughs> he, he, he fell into my trap. Ha-ha. Okay, the first thing in the ecosphere is um, open shot video uh, project is looking for help from non-programmers. Uh, in a blog post on their project site, the developers are asking for potential users to list what video and audio formats and codecs they need support for in the OpenShot video editor. No, I've not heard of this project before. No, I hadn't before a couple of weeks ago. And I thought I knew all the video editors. Yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah. Really work does on, Linux need yet another video editor? No, no, it doesn't. Well, that's what I thought. Doesn't it just need the ones it's got fixing? It needs one of them fixing. Yes. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, if you look at the, the about page for the for Open Shop video, they're basically saying they admit there are loads yeah. of videos out there, video editors out there, and we're making another one. Yeah. But hopefully this one will work yes. kind of thing. We, and they do kind of say it with an ironic nod at the fact that they're not saying anything different from everybody else. Yes. They're scratching their own itch and thinking they, they can do it better than everybody else. But, yeah, I mean, good luck to them. Hopefully yeah. it'll, it'll work and it'll be fantastic. Well, I, I dropped them a mail and... Um, and ask them about packaging, and they're going to try and get it into uh, PPA. Because at the moment, they've got some DEBs that you can download directly from their site. So you can download it via DEBs and install it. But they've got some custom versions of FFmpeg and some other stuff. Oh, lovely. Is, yeah, which is in the repository already, and that kind of gets a bit messy. So yeah. uh, I think they're working on doing a PPA. Which so we should happen. imagine Comic Plus One. Yeah, well, to get it into Comic Plus One, yeah. But definitely a PPA would make it easier. With yeah. video editors, I it's see it... I believe it when I see it, I think. You should be, take a look at the site, actually. It is quite I've, good. I've seen the site. Yeah, it's good. The yeah. site looks good. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, like, they, like they all do. <laughs> Diva had a fantastic website and a yes. fantastic demo video. Yeah. But there you go. Tobias Wolf has uploaded new versions of the popular open source Theora codec to his personal package archive to make it easier for Ubuntu users to update their video codecs to support the new the Snelder encoder, boasting a better quality to bandwidth ratio than H.264. The Snelder could help the push to get Og Theora more widely adopted on the web. Mm. Presumably a combination of HTML5 as well. Uh, well, no, not necessarily, no? because this, okay. is more, this is more about um, uh, it's, it's content a delivery. Level, isn't it? It's this a different is, level. I mean, yeah, this is, a, a, a combination of being able to embed video objects easily within HTML and having a new efficient codec. Yeah, to do so. Yeah, that's true. But this is the this is the encoding side. Uh, so it's, oh, uh, right, okay. uh, but you know, encodes and compresses very heavily, and also provides a very good quality uh, video. I think the most important issue about this actual di- whole part of this is who who thinks up these names. <laughs> I mean, seriously. I mean, why can't they come up with an easily <laughs> readable name? Presumably, yeah. it's from the same root as Theora, though. Well, yeah. where does that name come from? I think it's um a god of something. It's all Scandinavian mythology. Isn't yes. It? Yeah. Oh, now I know. Learn something new every show. The Mexican Ubuntu Loco team are joining the podcasting fray. Announced on their website, episode one of the Ubuntu Mexico podcast is now available in MP3 and OG formats. I had listened and couldn't understand a word of it. It's in yeah. um, Portuguese or Spanish. Or... That yes, explain it. Yeah, non-English, yeah. which <laughs> is no good for, for me. For, for reasons irrelevant, I'm actually on the... Uh, the Mexican uh, loco mailing list, yeah, okay. and oddly enough, the majority of their posts seem to be in English. Oh, excellent! But uh, yeah, so I mean, <laughs> even the ones about the podcast, and well, yeah, they were saying great podcast. You know, we've been wanting this for ages. Things are all written in English, but the, then I couldn't listen to the podcast. So. <laughs> That's probably really good, actually. They're a non-English language podcast. That's I mean, do we know if there are that many Ubuntu non-English podcasts? Um, I uh, well, I've looked on Miro and seen a few. Um, not all of them constantly maintained. So. Uh, yeah. And do they use Podcoder? 
Well, we should ask, we should them, to. ask them to. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and then they too can have people complaining that their podcast crashes their MP3 player. Yeah, but, Og player. Yeah, but alternative, alternatively, uh, they could just write their own 39 bash script. It's more than 30. It's about 120 now. <laughs> yeah. Half of them are comments. It's called bloat. App Center is now known as Ubuntu Software Store and aims to be a single graphical interface for package management in Ubuntu. Already the discussion is quite heated about what features will be provided what will be available in the store, and as always, with Ubuntu, the name of the project. Yes. There's a bit of a quandary about what to call it, whether App Center is the right thing or Software Store, because Software Store has has the Computation implication selling, that it's, it's selling, yet in the in the user interface there's a price field and everything you click on is free. <laughs> so she said, well, what's the point in showing it free? Well, obviously in the future there may yeah. well be uh, well, I, th- I think more than steps. may well be. I think it's well, yes. probably certainly if that's written in the, this earlier. The Lin Spire click and run warehouse are the same sort of thing. A lot of free applications you could install, but also ones that you had to pay for. And we, we did have, just on the App Center thing, we did have emails from um, Ian Pascoe and Chris Blow, who both emailed to tell us that the App Center is replacing all of the add and remove programs, Synaptic, Computer Janitor, Update Manager, and Software Sources different GUIs for oh, all those cool. different mm. things. And so there's just one, one place, place you use to install. Software. And is it going to be an installed application? Yes. Or like a, okay. Yeah, it'll be there by default. Version 1.0 is going to be in Karmic, and then there are lots of plans for the, the next release. And Matthew Paul Thomas has um, maintained a very, very comprehensive wiki page, uh, which we'll link to about the software store um, or App Center or whatever you want to call it, um, and um, has asked for help from all kinds of people to, to get it ready for Kalmyk. Cool. A request has been made for Jack to be installed uh, as a default on the Ubuntu Live CD, which you use, Tony, don't you? Yeah, I, mean, I use Jack for audio processing because um, it's real time and you can patch different elements of software together. Um, it sounds quite, it's quite a heavy application, so it's unusual to... I see it's suggested as being heavy as in big well as in complex okay um it's not straightforward to no. uh, understand what's what is going on i mean it's ideal if you want to do complex audio processing um and it is by it's in by default in ubuntu studio i believe yes yeah because apps like well, Ardor yeah. Yeah, need it, it. it does real time and what's well it supports real time and things so it is, it's basically like a, a virtual uh, sound device isn't it a sound card where you can actually pipe different connections connections yeah. in can't you yeah so you can connect different applications together so you can have a string of them so your audio can start off from the input of your sound card let's say from a microphone and then get piped through to uh, a processing unit and through a mastering thing through to a recording program and you can connect all these things just together with virtual cables if you like yeah. so if you're just talking on skype does it make use of that I mean, why why it's in this well, main thing? Well, it might be useful if uh, you're using something like a VoIP client, if you wanted to route your audio from, um, I don't know, a USB headset through something that records the call mm. and then into your VoIP client or something. May I suggest people actually read the thread because there are quite a few justifications for wanting to do it. There's a couple of applications that, that, that re- do benefit from having it. That's what they I are mean, mentioned in the thread. Something system-wise mm. uses it. Yeah, in the show notes. But then I'm not sure how that links up with Pulse and... Well, apparently there is a lot of communication between the Jack developers and the Pulse developers to okay. coordinate that stuff. Good stuff. Launchpad developers have asked for top three features. That they want in Launchpad, yes, ah. for the next version. So people have been posting what they want. See, this is a real stickler for Ooh. me because I keep coming up with like two or so and I can't quite get a third one to compose the email. So I've been putting it off and putting it off. Is it in your drafts? It <laughs> is in my drafts, it is. <laughs> what, what are your two then, Dave? Oh, no, no, that, that's super, super secret. You have to uh, subscribe to the main list and, uh, and, and wait to the email. Oh, well, there we go. That's a shame. I feel unfulfilled. A, a lot of people have been asking for uh, web hosting. So uh, uh, a project wiki and project web hosting because at the moment like you can't get that stuff. yeah exactly like yeah, okay. like basic web hosting because mm. at the moment you have to point to an off-site or you have to point to an off-site wiki or website for your project yeah i can see those and internationalization as well i don't think launchpad's available in i don't think launchpad itself is translated into other languages that's that's quite poor considering how much rosetta is used for translations yeah it, it actually, is of course now you're going to get Lots of emails from. Me. No, I'm pretty I sure know, I've seen the mail asking okay. for it to be translated in lots of. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> oh, okay. God. 
<laughs> hey, hey, we throw the fat out there and see if it sticks. Yeah, I'll get another horrible email maybe from we should ask, Graham or Matt. We should ask Matt if he wants to uh, come on the show sometime. And, uh, yeah, talk tell us, us all about, about Launchpad. Launchpad. Um, encrypted swap and encrypted home directory support is in the desktop CD installer as of the daily build on the 23rd of August. Mm. This has been a bit of a running th- theme throughout this season so far of um, talking about encrypted home and encrypted swap and general security on the portable yeah. devices. Yeah, because we originally said that, didn't we, when we talked about security, we said it's not possible to do it yeah. easily. Well, I thought, I I thought we were of the opinion that we would actually never see it. Mm. Uh, I think, well, when we, no, when we talked to Dustin, he said it, he hoped it would be an option. In the installer, mm, but right, certainly so. not default. Yeah. But not, not default. Some no. of it, I think, some of it. Evan was saying is actually in the sort of some of the bits and pieces were built, but you have to start ubiquity mm. with some command line switches to enable it. Yeah, and it makes me wonder what other extra bits and bobs there are in ubiquity that we don't know about. But the source is all there. That's true. <laughs> Get busy yeah, with grep. <laughs> <laughs> so is the idea that in the long run it would be default? Uh, I don't think. Well, Dustin said it wouldn't probably be default no. in Ever. the long run. So well, what's the just point because, then? Just well, because you can't, you can't do it. There, there, is, there is no easy button pressing way to make your home, home directory and swap encrypted at the moment. You, can't, you put a CD in, you go next, 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 to install and answer all the questions and there's no button anywhere that says encrypt my home. And I, just, I thought it was added briefly um, a few releases ago but then taken out um, whilst it was still um, in development. But, uh, I mean, I just thought that the whole point of encrypted home directory is that a swap or whatever is to protect your details and your personal Mm -hmm. bank finances or whatever. So it's not much good if only really clever geeky people can use it. No, but they can't. No, uh, that's the point. It's going in the installer now so that you don't have to be a clever geeky person. You just tick the box. Well, that's my point, is the ultimate idea that it's by default to encourage everybody to be having the home directory encrypted. Yeah, but there's a... There's a flip side to it, which is in the event that something goes horribly, horribly wrong and you forget your yeah. key, you're, you've lost your data. And you didn't know um, that you had encrypted your partition and then you yeah. take it to your mate, so your mate goes, I can't get anything off this. Or yeah. I mean, Dustin did have some reasons. They might be worth, you know, if, if anybody... Plus there's the, uh, the uh, CPU overhead of, uh, you know, on something like a netbook mm-hmm. where it's got a very low power CPU or on a mobile internet device yeah, or something, not, you might, you might enough, want to turn but, it off. Mm. Yeah, perhaps go back and listen to Dustin's interview again because he did talk about some of the issues why he didn't think it was going to be default or he, you know, he didn't want it to be default. I'm going to go and listen to that right now. Right, Dave's left. Excellent. That's the end of the ecosphere. It's time for your feedback. Ian Pascoe emailed in to say... Currently, for us in the accessibility community, it's basically Pulse Audio that sucks. The current recommendation is to remove it and rely on standard ALSA sound system. Mm. Problems like latency, unable to effectively deal with multiple sound sources, and stability are our major problems. What's more worrying is that Ubuntu is amongst the best of breed. Oh dear, that doesn't sound very good. No, but, but thank you for your feedback, Ian. Um, personally, I don't agree, but, um, but... Well, you're not in the accessibility community, are you? <laughs> yeah, you don't try to use a screen reader with your, uh, with your computer. Yes, but I, I mean, yeah, it, it's, it's not the long-term fix, is it? Yeah, oh, no. to remove Pulse Audio. Yeah. It, it, I'm sure it isn't a long-term fix, but on the other hand, if, if you, you can't if you use it, a oh, yes. you need to use your computer, and that's what you need to do to fix yes. it. Yes, okay, yes, yes. I think you've got to do that, really, haven't you? Mads Rosendahl emailed us saying... I've noticed that you guys often mention that you have several computers in your household, <laughs> desktop, server, laptop, etc. Yeah. And so I just wanted to let you know about my multi-ADM. Multi-ADM is a project for managing and updating installations of various systems. Currently supported is Debian-based and Ubuntu systems. Uh, Typo 3, which is a CMS, and WordPress. I hope you'll find this useful, although the project is still very embryotic. Embryonic, I think. Embryonic. (laughs) Um, Well, if he can't pronounce it correctly. Uh, (laughs) I I was very sad to see there was still um, no UDS interviews this cycle, Tony. I hope you'll pull yourself together for Karmic. Hey, now, come on. It, uh, I wasn't the only one who wasn't there. <laughs> Let's face it. Yeah, Nobody in this room. Yeah, none of us yeah, went I, to I, uh, I don't US. feel bad about blaming Tony for this. So back to multi-ADM, yeah. which was the main core of his email. Um, I've, I've never heard of it. I have no idea what it does. It sounds, I'm going to have a play with it. Yeah, it sounds a, a, a bit landscapey. I think. I, that's what I was going to say. There's a bit of overlap there, isn't there? What's landscape doing? It allows you to manage systems and upgrade packages and which is centrally. Actually, yeah, this, uh, it's got a few nice features. Um, I had a machine that uh, locked up. Um, it was I couldn't log into it. It was like completely frozen. Um, but logged onto the landscape website, 
and landscape lets you remotely run commands on other machines like that are the children of landscape so i just typed in a command and got it working yeah it was really good it's really helpful yeah i mean we probably should mention that that this is looking to be free software um and landscape is obviously a commercial application yeah it's a commercial uh, okay. canonical product ah uh, okay uh, fair enough okay so jessica emailed in I've been using Linux for a few years now. However, some members of my family still like to run Windows. One of them has upgraded their PC to Windows 7. However, that PC happens to be connected to an external hard drive, which I like to have access via Samba, but it doesn't work anymore. Are Windows trying to stop Samba seeing it or something? I was wondering if you'd noticed. Isn't that the improvements that were done in Windows Vista, I would think? Doesn't that happen every time? Yeah, Yeah, pretty much. Because we, we interviewed Jeremy Allison yeah. last season mm. and he was saying that they, they've had to work quite hard to put the features into Samba that are in the new version of Windows you know, file sharing and it's, stuff. It's more difficult for them to break it deliberately now because uh, it's, it's now a published standard under the EU disclosure oh, yeah. agreements. And, oh, okay. Um, it's not to say it's impossible. It's quite difficult <laughs> to understand. I but think, also well. it depends yeah. if you've got an up-to-date version of Samba installed that has support for that. Absolutely, yeah. And I don't know if, if the version of Samba in the Ubuntu machine that um, Jessica has running, yeah. um, has that latest version of Samba or not that has the support. Um, I personally don't have any Windows 7 or Windows Vista <laughs> machines, so I've not encountered this problem. But if any of our listeners have, then um, please let us know and we'll pass on your feedback to uh, Jessica. We had a voicemail in response to the one in the last episode about making the move from Windows to Ubuntu. Hi, the 1920s music, by the way. My name is Brian. I'm calling from West Yorkshire, UK. About the migration from Windows to Ubuntu, my advice is to initially have Windows and Ubuntu on dual boot with the aim of finding apps to replace all the things that you do in Windows and to get them all working. Make a log of everything that you do in the installation and setting up of the apps in Ubuntu. When you've got them all working, Save what you need in Windows and do a complete reinstall of Ubuntu, occupying the whole disk and set up as before. I found that I can do more in Ubuntu than I ever did in Windows. Goodbye, Windows. Bye. Thanks for the podcast. Fantastic. Excellent. Thanks, Brian. That's, that's really good advice. Yeah. And actually, it's, it's a good idea. I mean, I would personally not have thought of wiping it and reinstalling over the top. I probably would have deleted the Windows partition and moved and resized Ubuntu. But you get the benefit of doing something twice if he's documenting it you know it cements your own learning as well so that's a benefit yeah. too yeah that's great thank you for uh, taking the time to leave us a voicemail someone with the fantastic name of orange lasagna emailed in to say i have a cowan d2 with 3.54 firmware that doesn't crash but plays our ogs fine and dandily it does refuse to show the cover art though defaulting to the stock cover art not found image in the player might be useful for other cowan owners of similar players to upgrade the aforementioned firmware. Uh, this is about our OG files crashing <laughs> yes. certain OG players. I think we should actually contact Cohen directly because even though upgrading a firmware stops it from crashing, it still doesn't work as expected. And we, it is the same manufacturer that's coming up time and time again. Maybe we should ask them if they could use our podcast in their test suite. Yeah. <laughs> I think Linux Outlaws have had the same problem. No, they actually don't use it at all now. They say. Yeah, they yeah. got rid of the cover art, didn't they? Yeah, because of that problem. Though. Mm. Simon Wears has had his thinking cap on. Just a thought about your suggestion of a listener from Brazil doing an audio recording of his name and uh, I listen to Ubuntu UK podcast. You should try and get as many fans as possible to make such recordings because I'm sure you'd all love to hear your fans talking about you in recordings. No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and if such recordings were online, YouTube, for example, it would give you all some free advertising. That is a stunning idea. It is a very good idea, Simon. And in fact, we um, had two such uh, submissions from listeners. Um, one was from Josh Holland, who uh, regular correspondent Josh Holland. Unfortunately, um, he seems to have a bit of VoIP trouble in the middle of it. And it, 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 I, and says, you shouldn't have said Holland. that. You should have just played it because it's great. <laughs> I, know, I can play it. Hang on a minute. Right. This is, uh, this is Josh, uh, Josh Holland's effort. Unfortunately, a little bit of distortion. Hey, my name is Josh Holland and I listen to the Ubuntu UK <laughs> that's brilliant that's just uh, so that's sums up shame. VoIP yeah. <laughs> I've gone to UK but I disagree he must have pressed the hung up button yeah, okay. <laughs> but we did have this one from Bosnia and Herzegovina hi guys my name is Milos Mandaric uh, I'm from Sarajevo uh, you're uh, doing a great job 
the last podcast was really nice. You shouldn't stop at this. You should interview more people from community. Thanks for listening. Bye. Thank you. That's really nice. That's yeah, really cool. that's really good quality audio as well. Well, I might it's mention that if I remember correctly, that one was a native SIP call, proper voice over IP. Really? And the Josh Holland one was Skype. Ah, that's no, I, interesting. I, I think the one from... Um, Hit <laughs> Dave's smug, muck, smug face he, over here. He will, be, uh, he will be less smug when I say that actually he re- uh, the one from Bosnia and Herzegovina was recorded at home and he emailed it to us as an org attachment. <laughs> Are you sure? <laughs> yeah, I've got the email here. Oh. I mean, that's, that's a touch of sip snobbery there, I think. Oh, yes. <laughs> Let's have a segment on that. Sip snobbery. But yeah, if, if you listen to the show and you want to leave us a voicemail saying your name and that you listen to the podcast and where you're from, that'd be really, really cool. Yeah, that'd be lovely. Yeah, and you can hear all the details about how to get in touch with us at the end of the show cool jonathan totes spotted something odd recently how come in ubuntu 9.04 there are two volume controls uh, graphics the older one is shown where you click the speaker icon by the date top right by default the newer one only appears when i use volume controls which i think is part of the new notification ah. don't laugh i know it's pedantic but it might be interesting. So when he says volume controls, he means the soft keys on his keyboard, the volume up and down and stuff. Oh, right, okay. On my laptop, they appear in the, in the middle of the screen. What appears in the middle of the screen? The volume, when you use the soft keys. Hang on, hang on. I'm, I'm a bit confused. Um, what, what, what's the actual issue? Well, there's, a, there's a, an icon in the panel, a little speaker, mm. where you can click it and move a slider yeah. to make it louder and quieter. Yep, yep. by the clock. But yep. also, what he's saying is, when he um, uses the volume up and down buttons on his keyboard, a pop-up appears, mm-hmm. which is the new notification stuff, with a volume sliding up and down. Yes, yes, that thing. Okay. Sorry, when I say yes, that thing, Dave showed me his laptop <laughs> and I was confirming that the new indicator applet thing uh, notify on the window, on the screen. Yes, that sliding yeah. up and down. But, but there's even a, what seems to be a wonderful bug in Karmic at the moment where it seems to be in the middle of the screen rather than at the top. Yes, that's... <laughs> yes, another contentious thing. But one is actually a tool that you interactive, interact mm. with and one is just a notification. Shot. Yes, yeah. it's just a notification. Yes. Okay. But in previous releases, when you change the volume, the volume thing... Uh, would change up by the date oh, yes, that right, thing changed yeah, yeah. so i think that's the confusion is the fact that now that's not changing but a different window is appearing oh. that's the confusion i think i think jonathan that sounds like a paper cut well it's it working as quite, designed it design i suppose yeah. doesn't make it not a paper cut true yes dave stansby was inspired by the who do you think you were segment in the last episode he's written a blog post about his own thoughts on the segment and we'll link to it in the show notes Excellent. Thanks for taking the time to write that, Dave. It's really yeah. interesting. No, no problem. No, not, not Dave here, Dave. Dave oh. with the thing. Um, Josh Holland also emailed us to say... I came to Linux in the form of an Ubuntu gutsy when I saw a YouTube video of a flashy Compiz effects. It reels them all in, that does. Yeah. <laughs> I replaced Windows XP on my laptop and luckily all my hardware was supported. I turned the funky graphics up to 11 and wobbled my Windows like there was no tomorrow. <laughs> I downloaded Dive Into Python, which is a a book, forced my way through it, and just kept learning. At the same time, I was reading the FSF and GNU stuff. I agreed, and still do, with the motives behind the GNU slash. It's just a pain to type and say. But they did start it all off and wrote a lot of the core stuff. But I think think they've now lost their focus, especially with Bad Vista and Windows 7. Interesting. We were talking about that earlier. Yeah. But I do feel better off because I'm finding Linux... uh, because of finding Linux and the community. It's influenced me to change my degree from chemistry to maths. Wow. Opened up a number of jobs and is a great hobby. Hope to see you all at Lug Radio Live and Og Camp. Yay, and he excellent. also sent us a photo. Ah, oh, yeah, this is brilliant. <laughs> it is, isn't it? Yeah. This goes on the show notes. Definitely. Yeah. It, it's a... oh, we'll have to check what license he's given no, us. He, he has <laughs> given us under permissive. Um... Has he really? Yes, he has. Isn't he nice? So uh, what is it? Describe it. It's um, a sand sculpture of our logo. Yeah, which he made on holiday. Yeah. How bored was he Absolutely. on holiday? <laughs> <laughs> he says there's nothing to do in Whitby this time of year. <laughs> and that's all your feedback. Thanks for listening and thanks to everyone who took part via Twitter and Identica. If you'd like to get hold of us, you can email the show via podcast at ubuntu-uk.org. You can leave us a voicemail in a number of ways. Telephone 0845 508 1986 or VoIP podcast at sip 
www.ubuntu-uk.org and finally Skype using Ubuntu UK Podcast. You can send us your comments on Identica via identity.ca slash UUPC or Twitter, which is twitter.com slash UUPC, as well as getting updates from recording sessions. Alternatively, if you're into IRC, you can chat to us via the hash Ubuntu-UK channel on the Freenod IRC network. Join our Facebook fan page, search for Ubuntu UK Podcast, and we welcome suggestions, material, tips, reviews or rants and feedback, both positive and negative, so please do get in touch. And thanks also to our network of community mirrors listed on the website. Wow, I almost feel superfluous to requirements. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks for listening and join us next time. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.